Lowe sabe que trabajas muy duro. Por eso mereces darte gusto con ahorros de verano en herramientas confiables para pros. Ven a Lowe's hoy para disfrutar los ahorros de verano para pros y aprovecha hasta un 30% de descuento en herramientas y accesorios selectos. Lowe's es el hogar para encontrar buenas ofertas en las marcas más confiables como DeWalt, Bosch y Metabo HPT. Compre en tiendas o en Lowe's.com. Lowe's, el nuevo hogar de los pros. Hasta agotar existencias válido hasta el 77 solo en Estados Unidos. The following is a Hoop Bowl presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. Hey, hey, hey! Off and running! It's Wednesday. It's Fantasy NBA Today. We are... Rolling in the afternoon today, folks, I apologize, had some stuff come up here on the home front that pushed this one a tiny bit later, but you know what? It's the off season. The hell do I care? Episode 28 of the off season. I see folks celebrating when they get to like 50 episodes of something. I'm like, 50 episodes? That's, that's like two months, man. Give me the big numbers. Give me the big ones. I actually don't know what we're at right now. I know the iTunes page has a has a particular number, but there was a whole bunch that came before we switched what was it host providers, I guess. So I don't know. I could probably go back and get a round ballpark of a number, but this pod started in November or December. I think it was right around the start of the season 2017. So November of this year will have been in existence. The podcast will have existed for four years. I don't know how many weekdays are there in a year. We've never missed a weekday since the podcast's inception. Then there were these weird shows we did before that. Those of you that are with us way at the very beginning. No, that's not right. I'm getting that wrong. I think we got onto a host provider in November of 2016. Is that possible? Good Lord, has this pod been in existence for five years? Ah, well, in any event, uh, welcome to the show. I'm Dan Bespris. This is Fantasy NBA Today, a hoop ball presentation. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris. Thank you to those that have done so over the last day or two. Uh, it seemed like it was more the gambling degenerates as opposed to the fantasy degenerates, but you're all welcome. Come into my flock. You're all welcome here. And Dan Bespris. At Dan Bespris. <laughs> Not DanBespris.com. That did exist for a while, but I think... Pretty sure I still own the domain name, but I don't know that anything's happening on it. What's there? What's at danvespers.com? What the hell is this? Did somebody buy my domain? I may have forgotten to renew my domain name, ladies and gentlemen. That's not good. Oops. <laughs> the things you learn on June the 23rd, 2021, on a Wednesday afternoon. All right, here's where we're at. We are rumbling our way through the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad. We left off yesterday at OG Ananobi, preseason rank of 84. We'll pick up today with Brooke Lopez. That'll be the first name on our board. I do want to remind everybody once again, please check out our buddies over at manscaped.com. Get yourself a lawnmower 4.0 or get something smaller. I don't care. Get yourself a pair of The Shears. That's their luxury nail kit. You guys want to hear me trim my nails in the middle of a podcast? Of course you don't. Go do it yourself. I think it's only like 20 bucks for the shears. And you can still get 20% off and free shipping using promo code HOOPBALL20. You can also get yourself a full-fledged lawnmower 4.0. That's the big new trimmer. It's awesome. Built-in LED, waterproof technology, 90-minute battery life, pinch-free technology, sleek design they have an ear and nose hair trimmer. They got boxers. They got powders. They got lotions. They got shaving creams, shaving gels, a shaving mat to catch the hairs. I actually could definitely use that when I do my beard. So I sort of let it get a little rabbinic in between cuts these days. Thank you, pandemic. I haven't needed to add outside hygiene in a long time. I guess I probably should now. We're all starting to go places again. Whatever. As my father used to say, bleep them if they can't take a joke. I'm showing up hairy and disgusting. Or I could just use my Manscaped stuff. HoopBall20, again, the promo code, 20% off and free shipping on your order at manscaped.com. So Brooke Lopez is an interesting one to dive into because his preseason rank was 88, and I had his final rank at 47, which was very much, at the time, 
fairly controversial, I thought, because a lot of folks figured that with Bobby Portis coming in and the Bucks perhaps leaning into a smaller lineup and, and Brooke Lopez getting younger, that that type of stuff, those days were done for Brooke. But here's the thing. Lately, Brooke Lopez has shown himself to be an unbelievably durable basketball player. Remember a long time ago, Brooke Lopez was a stress fracture guy? That was the thing. That was back in his uh, middle Brooklyn days, but he went to the Lakers, played 74 games that season, 81 with Milwaukee two years ago, 68 last year in the shortened season, 70 this year. And here's the thing about Brooke Lopez. Since that 2013-2014 season that was shortened by the, the stress stuff, and even before that, it was really a one-year blip for him that has put a weird tag on a guy that otherwise has been a pillar of durability in his basketball career. Dude has been in the NBA since 2008. Let me give you the games played during the regular seasons every year for Brooke Lopez since 08. 82, 82, 82, 74. That might have been a lockout year. 72, 7, uh, sorry, 17. There's your one. 72, 73, 75, 74, 81, 68, and 70 out of the shortened seasons as well. This is a guy that doesn't miss basketball games. And for some reason, we've all deluded ourselves into thinking that he does. Brook Lopez has 1,500 blocks in his NBA career because he blocks shots and he doesn't skip ball games. He's a 10th category guy. So, in my estimation, I had him playing about 67, 68 out of their 72 games this year. I figured he'd miss a handful of back-to-backs. He's on a Milwaukee team that didn't have anything really to prove during the regular season. And that he'd beat his ADP on a per-game basis by, I don't know, I thought maybe two rounds, and you put that stuff together, and that gets him to my final ranking. Well, as it turned out, my final rank, you guys want to hear it again? 47. His final rank, by totals, 47. On the nose. Now, the handicap, we missed by a little bit on each thing. I had his per-game marker probably about 15 slots higher than he turned out to be. I had him in the 65 range on a per-game basis. He finished at 81 on a per-game basis. But then I had him at about 67, 68 games played, and instead he was at 70. So he racked up a few extra totals numbers there and smoked his ADP by three and a half rounds. So Brooke Lopez, even in a down year, turned out to be a pretty damn good draft. I would argue better for head-to-head than Roto because you want to maximize your top 75 or better guys on the Roto side, and he was close to that, so it's not all lost there. Uh, But that 47 final rank, leaning heavily on the durability, that's a big get in head-to-head leagues. He was a huge help for teams trying to win totals this year, in blocks in particular, uh, which were down, by the way, for him. Only one and a half blocks per game this season, but 70 ball games. That's a big deal. Every week he's getting you four to six blocks. Next name on the list, I don't think we need to go any deeper on Brooke Lopez, do we? Probably not. Was, well, this is someone that worked out better in Roto than in head-to-head, but generally not great in either one of them. And that was Big Al Horford, who was number 59 by averages at the time of his shutdown, which beat his preseason rank substantially his preseason rank mind you was 91 so he was a solid 30 slots ahead on a per game basis and he's another guy that lately had been really durable so I thought all right well you know what they're gonna rest him they'll give him the back-to-backs off there's no question Oklahoma City he's not playing in back-to-backs but I figured the shutdown was coming I don't know last two weeks maybe tack another five ish games on his rest days and that put me in, in my handicap at about 57 games played for Horford. 
Lowe sabe que trabajas muy duro, por eso mereces darte gusto con ahorros de verano en herramientas confiables para pros. Ven a Lowe's hoy para disfrutar los ahorros de verano para pros y aprovecha hasta un 30% de descuento en herramientas y accesorios selectos. Lowe's es el hogar para encontrar buenas ofertas en las marcas más confiables como DeWalt, Bosch y Metabo HPT. Compre en tiendas o en Lowe's.com. Lowe's, el nuevo hogar de los pros. Hasta agotar existencias válido hasta el 7-7, solo en Estados Unidos. What was the actual number on Big Al? I don't even really want to say. Do I have to say? 28. Yeesh. 28. Yeah, that's a miss. I mean, there's no way around it. I'd love to try to claim that we called the very good per-game stuff, but this was just a straight-up miss. Even in Roto Leagues, because you, you need more than 28 games out of someone like that. You, If you took Orford, you probably took him in like the 8th, ish round range and okay great like he's getting you fifth round value for two months but there were other guys going in the eighth round that were far better picks simply because they were able to last a little bit like crap even Kemba Walker on the stash turned out to be a better pick than Al Horford. And that's, and you know, when you're don't draft injured guys thing eh, eh, does better than the guy that you had on the old man squad list. You just got to take the L. And the reason isn't so much because of result, but because of a whiff on process here. Of course, Al Horford's per game numbers were going to be better this season. He got traded from a place where he was a power forward playing next to Joel Embiid and then converted into a backup center to the veteran anchor on a young team where he was going to be asked to do a lot of the facilitating and moving guys around on offense and defense. And so his role was going to dramatically increase season over season. But there was no way he was going to hit the number of games played to ever warrant being drafted in a head-to-head format. And a best-case scenario in Roto was probably the 57 games played that I listed a minute ago. I handicapped him on a best-case scenario because I love Al Horford's fantasy game, and I wanted to talk myself into him making sense. But he never did. If your best-case scenario is three to four games less than the league average, that means that anything else that goes wrong pretty much ends your chance to hit fantasy value. You have to be so far ahead of your per-game expectations to hit rank while missing that many games, that that there's these select few. Like, Miles Turner played 47 games, remember this year? He was a top 15 guy on a per-game basis, and because he missed 25 damn games, his totals rank was right on his ADP. This is a guy who beat his per-game marker. He was getting drafted... Uh, in the fifth round, and he was practically on the turn, basically, for most of this year, which is, by the way, I know that to that's like 35-ish slots or so. 35 slots is a long way to go. But 35 slots to climb into that first round range is actually way bigger than 35 slots going from 100 to 65, say. So Miles Turner is like is basically the one guy this year that was so great on a per-game basis that despite missing almost half the season, he still hit his mark. And there was no way that Al Horford was going to be that good. That's the, that's the reason that I'm upset with this call. He's, he is the old man squad name. He's, if it wasn't Tobias Harris, it would have been Al Horford until Philly kind of blew him up a little bit as the logo for the Dan Vespers old man squad. I guess it was LaMarcus Aldridge for a long time too, but, you know irregular heartbeat, etc. Al Horford had plenty of fantasy game left, but he had no chance of playing enough games this year to be a good draft pick. None. Again, a best-case scenario for Big Al, I thought was like top 50-ish per game numbers, right around 50. And he wasn't that far off of that. He was uh, 59, I think I said a minute ago. So that was like, he was pretty close to his best case scenario on a per game basis. But a best case scenario on a totals basis was playing, was missing 15 games. So 
How I got him to a final rank of 51 on my board, I really don't know, looking back. If I thought he was going to be number 50 per game and missing three or four games more than the league average, the best ranking I should have given him was 60, which still, by the way, would have been enough to get him on the old man squad. But when that's your best case, you're looking at it like, okay, um, what's the worst case? This, really, this was the worst case. This, I think, was worse than anyone could have ever expected. They shut him down way early this season. Gave him a lot of rest and turned him off. Just turned the motor off, let him play just enough to show teams that he still had a lot in the tank, and then, and then shut the car down. So, you know, you could make that argument that if you thought he was going to finish at 60, and he's getting drafted at 90, you take the shot at that's your best case scenario, and you live with it, and that's why I think we rolled the dice a little bit there. Because, again, if your eighth-round pick doesn't pan out, it's not going to sink your fantasy team. But as far as handicapping goes, this was off. It should have been worse. That was bad process, bad result. One begets the other. Next name on the list was Evan Fournier, which I, actually, I know as bad as his season turned out to be, I don't regret any part of this selection. Where the hell did he actually finish this year? I don't have those numbers in front of me on Fournier because he was uh, his ADP somehow ended up falling outside the top 100. Is that where we're at now? Let me make sure I've got these numbers right. Yeah, Fournier had an ADP of 105. His preseason rank was 105. So I I, I have all the top 100 guys listed out from the, the worksheet we had going last week, and then I foolishly dive-bombed into this podcast without uh, double-checking that I had the numbers on the other guys. So Evan Fournier was actually number 90 by averages, despite being traded to a team where he was going to be like the third option, um, I'm not at all upset about the Evan Fournier old man squad call. There was almost no way for us to know that he was going to play 47 games total this year. But his numbers in Orlando were beefy as hell. 20 points, 3 boards, 4 assists, a steal, almost 3 three-pointers on 46% from the field, one of his best career marks. Uh, and around 80% at the free throw line. Everything was great. I mean, he was, if we thought he was having a great season last year in Orlando, where he was at 18.5 points, 2.5 rebounds, 3 assists, and about 46 point, eh, closer to 47% shooting last year, he was actually doing better this year in Orlando prior to all of the injuries and the COVID and all that stuff. Last year in 66 games, Fournier was number 73 on a per-game basis, which I believe included... Did that include bubble games? He might not have made the bubble. I, I block it out a little bit. I don't remember if he made the bubble trip or not. Uh, I don't think he did. The Maybe he did. Who cares? It doesn't matter. So on a per-game basis, he was clobbering. He was crushing it. He was actually better than that top 75 during his Orlando minutes this season. But there was COVID, there was injury, there was the back, there was the knee, there was the whole thing with him. And then there was the trade, the COVID was after the trade, uh, to a team where he wasn't going to be as featured. And that's, I mean, you have to be okay with that type of question mark. We knew the Magic weren't going to be very good. In fact, I had their team win total under as one of my pretty strong leans at the beginning of this year because they didn't make any improvements. They lost Jonathan Isaac. So this is a team that had the arrow pointed the wrong way and a blow up was imminent. The question mark was who was going to get traded Vooch. Could they move him? Could they move Aaron Gordon? Could they move Evan Fournier? Well, they moved them all, not Terrence Ross. They shut him down, but they moved everybody else. And so you had to know that that was going to be a risk with taking him as like a ninth, 10th round kind of guy. But we're talking about a ninth, 10th round kind of guy that actually had top 75 or better upside. I don't regret this selection at all, despite the fact that he missed a ridiculous amount of time this year. We could not have seen that coming. By totals, he was number 153 because of games played issues. But the fact that despite his clunky numbers in Boston, he was still number 80 on a per-game basis this year, I actually call Evan Fournier a near miss on victory. And Boston traded Kemba Walker away, so Fournier probably starts for the Celtics next year. 
And if he's not starting, then he is chucking off the bench. Is it going to be Smart, Fournier, Brown, Tatum, and Horford? Is that your starting unit, or do you throw in some... Do you, do you throw in, like, a, a more stout power forward and not force Jason Tatum to play the four game in and game out? I don't know. Boston will figure that out. They hired Ime Udoka, by the way, as their head coach today, so that's pretty cool. I think Celtics got a good one there. We'll see how that all shakes out. But Fournier is going to play in Boston. He doesn't have nearly the per-game upside that he showed in Orlando when he was taking 14 shots a game while with the Magic this year. But he still took 12 and a half shots with Boston, and that's a number that could actually probably creep up ever so slightly. Took 12 and a half shots during the post... Oh, sorry, he took 11 shots for the Celtics during the regular season. 12 and a half was during the postseason. That's probably a more reasonable number for him. 12 and a half shots a game gets him just inside the top 100. So, yeah. I mean, he'll probably go really late. I'll, I'll tell you guys right now, Fournier's probably back on the old man squad again. Next name on the list was Duncan Robinson, who had a very weird year. Uh, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a disappointment. On a per-game basis, he was number 121. I was expecting better. I wanted him right around the edge of the top 100 on a per-game note. And then with the Heat, everybody was going to miss something, we thought, except apparently Duncan Robinson. He played all 72 games. So if if you drafted him, you kind of got lucky because our hope with Robinson was that he was going to exceed his draft slot on a per-game basis. He was drafted about 108, so he actually underperformed by about one round, which, again, not a huge deal, but when you're drafting at 108, you're looking for someone on a per-game marker that's could get inside that top 80 type range, and he didn't get close to that. From a head-to-head standpoint, he actually turned out to be a, a, a pretty good hit because of the 72 games played. So this is a guy that just played every single game and hit a crap ton of three-pointers, and so by totals, he was number 78. So I'd love to take all the credit in the world for the fact that I had his final rank at 80 on the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad, and I missed by two slots, but we didn't get there at all the way that I thought we were. So I actually am not pleased about Duncan Robinson having a final rank of 80. As a Roto guy, I want my dudes to be posting better per-game stuff, and if they miss five, six, seven games here and there, it's not going to kill me. Duncan Robinson turned out to be a much better head-to-head pick on my board, and it looks like a really nice win, but in actuality, it sort of wasn't. Now, to Robinson's credit, he did ramp up as the season went on. He started off very slowly this year and then ultimately got back up and kind of beyond where the uh, the expectations would be. The problem is that the early season shooting struggles really weighed down his field goal percent. And actually it was both percents for Robinson. And I, I sort of look at his numbers and wonder if he really was truly healthy this year because he didn't get to the foul line as often. He shot worse from the free throw line, 83%. He's a career 87%er there. 44% uh, from the field after 47 last season. If his percentages rebound next year, he jumps right back inside the top 100. That's pretty much all it takes. Now, we'll see if Miami makes any moves in the offseason. If they don't, then he'll probably just slot right back in playing a ton of minutes and shooting a ton of three-pointers. Still, I don't like how we got there, and there's a certain amount of regret in trying to take credit for something like that, so no. Will Barton, now we're getting into the deep weeds here. So uh, these were the last... Will Barton had a preseason rank of 133, so the fact that this one didn't hit, I sort of don't care, because this is like the who are you going to take with your last pick sort of thing. Will Barton was number 174 on a per-game basis. He went through about a one-month spell in the middle of the season where his percentages and shot attempts were high enough that he was a worthwhile fantasy contributor. But uh, his game has fallen off now. I think there's just too many injuries, and he likely won't remake the Dan Bespris old man squad going forward. That one was a, a bit of a flyer. It didn't work out. Tim Hardaway Jr. had a preseason rank of 139. 
This one, actually, I got pretty close to right, as, as wrong as Will Barton may have been. Tim Hardaway Jr. was all over the map this year, at least in terms of where he ranked. He was number 134 on a per-game basis. Uh, but he closed the year really strong. It just sort of took the Mavs a long time to figure out that he was the best option alongside Luka Doncic in terms of spacing the floor and scoring points. And so he finished the year off with uh, a flourish. And he played 70 out of their 72 regular season games. So for Hardaway, another guy that at the end here made more sense from a head-to-head standpoint. He was number 93 in head-to-head leagues. Uh, I had his final rank at 89 in head-to-head league, or in by totals, so that was pretty close, actually. Um, I just I was hoping that they would let him run with the starters for most of the year. Uh, Josh Richardson being kind of in and out of the starting lineup screwed that up, and I, I probably should have known better with the Mavericks than to expect them to stick with anything for more than a couple of weeks, but Rick Carlisle's out now, so again, I'll take things that are up in the air for 5,000, Alex. Um We'll see on Hardaway. He's a free agent, too. So someone may sign him, goes to a place where he's going to shoot a whole bunch, then great. Uh, if he goes to a place where he's like a fourth, fifth option, then you wipe him off because he's a guy that needs the volume to get there. I had Jay Crowder preseason rank. Uh, he was preseason rank 145. I had his final rank at 96. This one actually is not all that far off the mark either. He, believe it or not, Crowder ended the season inside the uh top 100 i believe make sure i'm getting some of this stuff right here the uh oh no excuse me i gotta i got my numbers crisscrossed let me back off on hardaway as well tim hardaway was number 151 on the season but he did play in most of the ball games this year uh jay crowder was number 127 roughly on a per game basis i guess it depends on what site you're looking at i've seen him as low as 135 he's somewhere in that neck of the woods This one was very much a maybe kind of play. Again, preseason rank of 145. Uh, I had his final ranking as 96 by totals. His final totals ranking this year was actually 121, so that one was a miss. I don't know what I thought was going to be better for Crowder. Probably the durability, probably the steals. Everything else was relatively predictable for him. There was no upside there. And so you could make the argument that, Dan, you shouldn't really be drafting these guys at the end because there's no upside. These are guys that generally overperform on the totals board because they are relatively durable, Hardaway, Crowder, and make more sense when you've taken some shots, particularly in a head-to-head league, and you need to round out your roster with someone that you can just trust to play, like 68 ball games, and not give you zeros oh, okay, I don't have to stream this slot kind of thing. So, no, no real big hit there. And then the last one was Terrence Ross, who, much like Evan Fournier, there was the hope that he would get this massive usage bump, and it actually worked for a while. He was, like, top 40 for the first three or four weeks. Then he went ice cold, then he got warm again, and then he got hurt, and then they shut him down. So he played only 46 ball games. Uh, on a per-game basis, he, he actually did beat his his rank of 145 he was like 125 ish but you're looking for more you're looking for my hope was that he was going to end inside the top 100 on a per game basis and he was teetering on it for long stretches he just couldn't stay there because of well injury and orlando so terrence ross didn't quite work out i don't feel that bad about that one at least the way i do about jay crowder that was a zero upside play i don't know why he's on this list that was kind of dumb Tomorrow, we will finish up the Dan Bespris Old Man Squad. We'll have our last section, the Dan's non-boring value guys, which generally sucked. But we'll go through them. We'll try to isolate why ones hit that did, ones that missed. We'll figure out why those didn't work either. And uh, we will work on that through tomorrow. And then Friday, we'll talk basketball for the most part, just kind of talking hoops. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, everybody. This was Fantasy NBA Today, slightly shorter edition. That surprised me. I guess we probably could have gone into the non-boring, whatever the hell I call them, non-boring value guys. But, I don't know, I felt like grouping them together would make for a pretty reasonable one-chunk podcast. And then, next week, we'll begin our tour of the teams in the NBA. We're going through them, probably one by one. By the end of that, we'll basically be at free agency. 
there'll be stuff to talk about in between there. Don't worry. We got plenty of things going on. I am Dan Vespers. Thank you as always, folks. Really appreciate you guys listening. Hit me up if you want to start a podcast. I mean it. I really do. I mean it. At Dan Vespers on Twitter. Have a great Wednesday. Uh, oh, you know what I forgot? Ha <laughs> ha. Forgot to talk about the ball game tonight. Atlanta at Milwaukee. Bucks favored by eight with a total of 225. These teams each got three days of rest between finishing off uh, or sorry, I think Milwaukee got three days and Atlanta got two days of rest after their seven game series in the previous one. I don't know what kind of legs they have coming back in this ball game. This is very much a feel it out type of performance uh, where I'd like to bet the Hawks catching eight. That's probably the strongest lean I'd have to anything in this ball game, but I don't think I quite have the stones to do it. Uh, I don't know if I do. And then, of course, yesterday, DeAndre Ayton on the inbounds dunk with one second to go. The Clippers blew a golden opportunity to get even. And it sounds like Chris Paul is going to be back for the ball game tomorrow. So we'll talk much more about the Clippers and the Suns on tomorrow's podcast. As far as tonight's game goes, from a matchup standpoint, I'm seeing a lot of people saying that the Bucks are just going to steamroll the Hawks. I just, I don't see it that way. I feel like... Joel Embiid was the worst possible matchup for Atlanta. Now you bring Clint Capella back into the mix a little bit. Brooke Lopez will do a nice job defending him. So I'm not talking so much about Capella doing a ton offensively. Although Embiid certainly, he moves his feet better than than Brooke Lopez does. Brooke is going to be into drop coverage. Atlanta's going to be shooting a lot of threes. That'll probably allow the pace to get going. Milwaukee's not going to slow it down the way that the Sixers did. Um, so maybe the over, maybe the Hawks. That's kind of the direction I'm looking in this ball game. And uh, those are your thoughts on the game tonight. Almost forgot to talk about that on today's show, but now I didn't. And considering I actually wrapped up the show already, I guess I don't really have to do that again. So bye-bye. Lowe sabe que trabajas muy duro, por eso mereces darte gusto con ahorros de verano en herramientas confiables para pros. Ven a Lowe's hoy para disfrutar los ahorros de verano para pros y aprovecha hasta un 30% de descuento en herramientas y accesorios selectos. Lowe's es el hogar para encontrar buenas ofertas en las marcas más confiables como DeWalt, Bosch y Metabo HPT. Compre en tiendas o en Lowe's.com. Lowe's, el nuevo hogar de los pros. Hasta agotar existencias válido hasta el 7-7, solo en Estados Unidos.